Hi everyone, Chris here. And in this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a essay that was posted on YouTube and I'm gonna give this student some feedback. What I'm also gonna do is show you some really useful online tools that are 100% free that you can use to analyze your own essays. And we're gonna look particularly at uh, vocabulary, how you can use free online tools to help you improve your vocabulary. So to give you some background, what I did last week was I posted a video where one of our VIP students uh, who lives very, very close to our office, she lives just about two hours away from our office. So she came up to our studio and we worked together on a question and we posted the video up of us going through the question together step by step. If you want to check that video out, go on to YouTube and look at IELTS Writing Task 2, Band 6.5, student if you type that in I'll also link it above this video and you can go through that video and have a look yourself but at the end of the video what I did was I set you guys a challenge to complete and it was great to see so many of you posting your essays obviously I'm only one person I can't give individual feedback to hundreds and hundreds of people and um, but what I promised that I would do and what I'm going to do today is to pick one of them which I've done here, and I'm gonna go through this and help you guys out as much as possible. Um, a couple of things before we begin. Number one, in general, the standard of essays that were posted below this video were very, very high. In general, it was very good. What I didn't want to do, because I think it would be a waste of time just to pick a really, really good essay and talk about how great it is, What I, because it wouldn't really help anybody. What I decided to do instead was to pick an essay that has very, very, very typical mistakes in it. Mistakes that examiners see over and over and over again. And it's not because this student is a really bad writer or their English is very bad. It was very apparent, very obvious from looking at this that they have some misconceptions about what the examiners are looking for, or maybe they've been looking on YouTube at some people teaching them IELTS that maybe they don't really know what they're doing or they haven't been examiners before or maybe they're more interested in getting comments and likes and subscribers than actually helping students or maybe they have a 10 day school where the teachers have misconceptions about the test as well. So we'll have a look here. And, and please don't be really critical in the comments of this person. Uh, um, we're not here to criticize them, we're here to help them improve their essay. Um, so you know, don't be mean in the comments about this person because they were, they're trying to improve themselves. And in order to get better at anything, you have to fail and you have to um, suck at stuff for a while. And, and But the, the, the key thing is that this person tried, it's not to the standard that they want it to be, but by putting themselves out there, by going outside of their comfort zone and, um, making themselves available uh, to be criticized, then they're gonna really improve. So um, bear that in mind too. So here's the question. Some people say that in all levels of education, too much time is spent on learning facts and not enough on learning practical skills. Do you agree or disagree? So I'm gonna take you through this step by step and trying to give you an idea of what an examiner would be thinking about uh, when they are uh, um, looking at this. And you might look at this and say, oh, I would never make that mistake. You would be surprised that under, under exam conditions on test day, you would make a lot of these mistakes. And and there's a lot of things that are in this essay that it's, it's clear that this person has probably learned from someone who doesn't really know what they're doing. So, and this is not this person's fault. It, you know, they are a student and they're probably learning from someone who is calling themselves a teacher and, you know, if you are in that position, you're going to believe someone if they're telling you to do this, do that. So let's have a look at what they've done here. So let's have a look at this first sentence. Majority argue that theory of the subject is being taught far more raw, more rather than practicing in all academic levels, such as primary, secondary, high school, or in higher education, and separated time for practical lessons is not satisfiable to learn in the field of education. So let's just take this first one. What this person has been taught, it, we see this 
over and over and over again. What this person has been taught is really two things. Number one, start your essay with a general background statement related to the question, which is a complete waste of time. And when you combine that with the second thing that this person has been taught, which is try and use fancy vocabulary and fancy grammar structures and make your grammar structures complex in order to impress the examiner in some way, when you combine that general background statement with fancy vocabulary and a very long complex sentence, you get this. And I would describe this as a headache sentence. You have to read it three, four, five, six times and it gives you a headache to try and understand what the person is trying to say. If I was, if this was my student, the first thing that I would say to them is, you are, you do not get extra marks by using fancy vocabulary that is wrong, okay? So for example, this word, satisfiable, doesn't make any sense. Um, if we have a look here, let's have a look at some of the other vocabulary. The theory, academic, practicing, primary, secondary, they're just throwing in a bunch of different um, words that they think relate to the topic are going to impress the examiner. They've also tried, I don't really know whether what they're doing, they're trying to use maybe the passive, they're trying to make their sentence as complex and as long as possible. You can get a band nine and write a simple sentence. You can get a band seven and write multiple simple sentences. When I'm talking about simple sentences, I mean one clause. Um, some of your topic sentences, for example, might have just one clause in it and be a nice simple sentence. The, exam the examiners, if they're looking to give someone a band seven, eight or nine, they're not looking at, did this person only use complex sentences with multiple clauses in it? They're looking at, did they use a mix of simple and complex sentences? If you know the, the higher that you go up the bands, the, the majority or the higher the ratio of sentences will be complex, but this student is not capable of doing this. So it is a bit like going to the gym and trying to lift weights that you cannot lift. You're going to injure yourself. It is counterproductive. So when you combine this with uh, not really know what they're do know what they're doing in terms of grammar, vocabulary, or structure, or you know, writing a, a, an introduction in general. And again, this is not the student's fault. This is what whatever online resource or YouTube video or teacher has told them this because we don't come out of the womb and, and start doing things like this. Um, it is not intuitive for us to write in this way. Someone has told them to do this. And what we often see as well is they might have the structure from one website and then their teacher tells them another structure and then another online resource tells them about vocabulary. So it's like a mix match, it's just a mess. Um, find one source that you trust. I'm not saying that because I want you to follow me or trust me. We have way more students than we could ever deal with. Um, so I'm not saying this to get you to follow me. I'm saying this because I want you to get the scores that you need. Follow one system and just do that and master that system. So moving on, these essay will provide some agreements about learning much more in a way of practice, which would be better way. So there's no position here. There is no clear position. There's no clear agree or disagree. So in order to improve this, I would say, pick one side, either you agree or you disagree. Think of two reasons, two main ideas to support that. So if you agree, think of two reasons why you agree. If you disagree, think of two re reasons why you disagree and just put them in the clearly in the introduction. So I would, instead of having a general background sentence, I would just paraphrase the question as Simona did. So have a look at that previous um, video if you wanna see what she did there. And then just say, I agree with this, or I disagree with this, because your two ideas. You are not really doing anything here with this second sentence. This comes from 
a lot of teachers, a lot of online resources, a lot of YouTube channels are teaching people to add in at the end, this essay will discuss both views and come to a reasoned conclusion or something like that, um, which doesn't really do anything. Um, you only put that in if you've literally nothing else to write. And for most of you, you, you will have something else to write. Um, so this introduction, what is an introduction supposed to do? It is supposed to introduce the topic and help the reader understand what the rest of the essay is about. So introduce the topic, you do that by paraphrasing the question, and then make it clear what the rest of the essay is about by stating clearly what your position is. For this, that will be saying, do you agree or disagree? And you could also put your main ideas in there. Um, and that helps the examiner. Why do we write anything? We write to clearly communicate with the reader. Does this help the reader? No, it gives them a headache. So, and again, not criticizing the person, not criticizing the student, but it is we see this every single day at IELTS Advantage where people are using seven, eight, nine different strategies, most of them are wrong, and just sticking it into one um, uh, essay and hoping for the best. That's not going to help you. Help you. All right, so let's have a look at the first main body paragraph here. All over the world, most of the classrooms of primary and secondary schools have the same structure, which is not get dedicated to experimenting as they consist of only traditional tools such as desk, blackboard, chalk for teaching factual information. Okay. Some people say that at all levels of education, too much time is spent on learning facts. So what has this got to do with learning facts or not enough practical skills? So uh, the main thing you should be doing is answering the question. All right. So you could basically forget about 90% of the other things. And if you just answer the question, you are going to be, get a pretty good score. Um, I don't know whether this opening sentence here actually is related to the question. Uh, we would call this like a, a shotgun approach where the person looks at the general topic and they would then just write as many different things related to the general topic. So this general topic is education um, and try and cram in as many big words as possible um, with the hope that the examiner will somehow magically look at those words and be like, oh my God, this person said experimenting and dedicated in secondary school and Blackboard and teaching factual information. They know a lot of vocabulary. Vocabulary is 25% of your total mark. Um, what about the other 75%? Um, and it's also not about using as many big words as possible. It is about using them effectively, appropriately, and most importantly, accurately. Um, so instead of doing this, again, what you should do here is pick one side that your position is going to be very clear and then think of two reasons why you agree or disagree and then take your first idea and put it in your topic sentence here in your um, first main body paragraph. And that tells the examiner very clearly, I've understood the question and I'm answering the question for you. You're making it easy for yourself and easy for the examiner. This is not making it easy for you or the examiner. But this is not a good way to improve productivity in learning process. Again, nothing to do with the actual question. Firstly, teaching facts without practice can cause children to forget the lesson frequently and can result them in frustration because of the fact that this method may not suit the pupil's style of learning and may be simply boring. Nothing to do with the actual question. The question is about too much time spent on learning facts and not enough on practical skills. The difference between learning, rote learning, versus things that you can use in the real world. Um, this has nothing to do with it. Nevertheless, practice would be beneficial if it were applied more in these lessons since almost all school children are kinesthetic learners who can perceive the theory by movements. Th this is more about how we learn different styles of learning, not about the difference between learning facts and practical skills. 
And again, you will see this a lot where people will put in words like kinesthetic and think that's a band nine word because some teacher has given them a list of um, band nine vocabulary, stick that in their, their essay, but it doesn't really do anything to help them answer the question. Um, what you'll also see here, um, you'll see it more in the second one, um, but what they'll do is they'll put a, a bunch of discourse markers. So let's put this one in red. So it's, it's really clear what this student's strategy is. Their ingredients are lots of big words, lots of discourse markers, and things in general related to the general topic. And they just shoot that out onto the page and it like a big mess on the page. And again, I keep emphasizing this point. This is not this student's fault. Um, if you teach someone to do this, they're going to do it because they think that you are a teacher and you know what you're doing. Um, or you go onto some online forum like Reddit or something like this and you, you'll find people talking about, oh, I used lots of discourse markers and I memorized these bunch of uh, band nine words and I just uh, introduced the topic with a general background statement and I got a band eight. No, you didn't. <laughs> All right. So let's read this. Furthermore, in high schools and higher education practices emphasize more. However, it may not enough for future employees because the individuals of all levels are job seekers who are preparing for first job interview. And in this case, application of theory should be done fairly more. Needless to say, whether the candidate stays on the position of certain jobs or not, it is only depends on candidate's practical skills. Moreover, first job interview is not held on the theoretical knowledge. So there's no one central topic um, in this paragraph. They're jumping around from topic to topic to topic instead of just having one main idea, explain that one main idea logically, and then have an example to support that one main idea. Um, so your topic sentence, one main idea, and then explain that idea logically and support with a relevant example so it's one idea and you don't change in the paragraph all right instead of jumping around like this and if you didn't have any discourse markers in there it probably would be better than having one two three four five or even more and none of them really making sense most essays will have maybe one or two, but don't go into the test thinking, I need to use one, two, three, four, five, like a number of discourse markers, linking words um, in the actual essay or in the paragraph. That's the wrong way to think about it. If it's appropriate to use that discourse marker, then use it. If it's not, don't. In the same way that you would use them in your own native language, you wouldn't go into the te um, you wouldn't be writing an email and think I have to use however, therefore, nevertheless, moreover, and furthermore in this uh, in this email. It wouldn't make any sense, and it would be very difficult to write. So why do you think IELTS are looking or IELTS examiners are looking for you to do that? In conclusion, I totally agree. So they've put their conclusion in here. But why wait to the end? Your position should be clear throughout the entire essay. Again, this person has probably been told, don't tell them what your uh, position is, what your opinion is, until the very, very end. That's how you do it. Um, is that how you do it, really? Um, did this, does this mean that I should be surprised at the end? So I should be just confused, 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 totally confused, totally confused. Oh, they put it at the end band nine. That's not how it works. In conclusion, I totally agree that much more time should be spent on for experiencing our knowledge than facts, whether learners age is young or old. Ex experiencing our knowledge, this doesn't make any sense. So again, what this person is trying to do is use compli complicated, complex language because they think that's how you get the score that they need. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that every single word should be as simple as possible and you should only use three-letter words 
and very simple sentences, but you should not use language that you don't know how to use. Because again, it's like going to the gym and like at the gym, I can bench press 100 kilograms, but if I try and bench press 150 or 200, I'll injure myself. That would be ridiculous to try and do that. I would need to build up to 105 and then 110 and then 120 over the course of months and slowly get better. That's exactly what you should be doing with your grammar and with your vocabulary, especially. Use the vocabulary that you currently have, that you're comfortable with, and slowly build it up over time. If you try and do what a lot of IELTS teachers tell you to, to do, which is learn a list of vocabulary, then you're going to get in all sorts of trouble. So I'm gonna give you some um, uh, online tools that you could use to help you with your vocabulary. One is this, called Text Inspector. And what it does, it does a number of things, but one of the things that it does is it breaks down your writing and it looks at each word individually and it looks at the level of that word. So in that essay, there were 44 words at A1, so the low, lowest level. Um, then we have A2, slightly higher, B1, B2, sort of intermediate, C1, C2, advanced words. Now, a great thing that you can do is you could go on to um, the, the Guardian or the New York Times or the Times or some very, very um, good, reputable newspaper and go to a article, take it, copy and paste it into this text inspector and you'll see that most of the words will be A1, A2, B1, B2 and like less than 5% will be C1, C2. Or even better, go to a uh, an academic journal, um, Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Stanford, a very, very high level university, and you'll find lots and lots of academic papers there. Uh, copy and paste some of that into this tool, and you'll see the exact same pattern. The majority of the words will be A1, A2, some will be B1, B2, and a very small percentage of them will be C1, C2. Very high level writing, but a very small percentage of the words will actually be high level. A band nine essay does not have 100% C2 words in it. How could it? You have to use the word the, a, uh, and simple prepositions, words like and, for example, will come up again and again and again and again and will comprise the bulk of your writing. So this demonstrates that all of those people that are telling you that the key to getting a high score is to use really high level language and only use band nine words, they're not actually talking sense, let's say. But while you're um, writing your own essays, what you can do is you can take it, you can put this in here, put it into text, text inspector, click analyze, and it will analyze all of the words in there for you, and then go to Lexus EVP, and it'll give you this nice little breakdown. There's also a nice little tool here, it's totally, all these are totally free by the way, um, wordcounter.net and it not only counts your words it's important to know how many words that you're writing of course and um, but what is more interesting is this keyword density all right and um, so you'll see that this person repeated the word more six times practice four times job four times uh, theory three times so while, while you're practicing what you can do is you can paste it in here at the end and you can see you know if you're if you're doing 10 essays a week, you will soon see that there are words that you repeat very, very often. And there may be words that you could change. There are some words that are just either really difficult to change or more technical nouns that it's just impossible to change that word. Um, but there are other words, more general words that you could use, um, uh, you could find here and you could change those words because the more variety we have in general, uh, the higher vocabulary score is going to be, as long as those words are also appropriate and accurate. So let's say you took the word practice, all right? So you've seen here, okay, I uh, used the word practice. 
too many times, how could I change that? You could put this into thesaurus.com, but you need to be very, very careful with online resources like this because you can't just look here and say, oh, thesaurus.com told me that proceeding is a synonym of practice, therefore I can automatically use that. You can't, you need to then look it up in a dictionary to make sure that the meaning is the same. A very good dictionary for IELTS is Collins, it's free, um, but it gives you the pronunciation, it gives you the different word forms, it gives you lots of example sentences, um, it gives you collocations, it often gives you synonyms as well. Um, so for example, if we see here, practice, we need to understand is this a noun or is it a verb? like to practice. So let's say it is the verb um, to prepare. So prepare, is that going to be the same as practice? Well, we're going to look up uh, the noun or the verb to make sure. So we'd have a look to see, okay, with verb, to do repeatedly in order to learn or become proficient. All right, so this is what we're looking for. We're looking for a synonym that means the same as that. Rehearse. Does this mean the same? Okay, so have a look. When people rehearse a play, dance, or piece of music, they practice it in order to prepare for a performance. So it does kind of mean the same thing. It is a synonym, but we probably couldn't use that because it's within the context of rehearsing a play, a dance, a piece of music, something to do with the arts in order to prepare for a performance that you are going to do. So if you put rehearse in here um, without really checking the meaning of it, you would technically be wrong. But if you follow that practice over and over and over again, uh, you go back, okay, rehearse wasn't good, uh, maybe train, try that, put that in, look up the meaning, okay, that matches, it means the same thing, same context, then you could use that one. So you're building up your vocabulary, you're building up your knowledge, and you're building up your ability to use those words in a sentence. Hopefully that was useful. Thank you very much for watching. And if you didn't watch this video, uh, go and have a look there. You'll find it very useful. And we also have uh, our YouTube channel here, you. which has lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of videos to help you out with IELTS. Um, and if you like them, everything's for free. The only thing we ask in return is that you subscribe or give us a like or just say thanks in the comments. It means a lot to know that the work we're doing is actually helping people. Um, and I'll see you next week for another IELTS video. Thank you. Bye-bye.